Welcome. My name is Jill Rockbeisel, the chair of the department, and I want to welcome everyone to our Grand Round series. And I'm trying to see, maybe I shouldn't mess with it. Uh, I was trying to see how many people we have online. How many? 63 online, great. Um, so welcome everyone. Um, I am honored and pleased to be able to introduce our grand round speaker, which is our very own Dr. Christopher Miller, who's an associate professor in our department. Um, after completing his medical degree in 2005 from the Universidad Federal de Santa Catarina in Florinia Nel Paulus, Brazil, I don't know if I said that right or not. <laughs> but I tried. <laughs> Dr. Miller um, went on to enter the adult residency program here in our program and graduated in 2012. Uh, over the years, we have come, have all come to know uh, Dr. Miller and understand him as not only an outstanding and eternal teacher, but an eternal student himself, never stopping learning. Hopefully we're all in that category. He went on to uh, train in the adult psychoanalyst uh, analysis in 2018. He graduated um, from the Washington Baltimore Center for Psychoanalysis, rendering him a highly qualified uh, individual to be our director of psychotherapy education for the residency program. In addition, he was our associate training director until June of last year when he then accepted a position as the medical director for psychiatry for our psych associates uh, practice, outpatient practice. Dr. Miller has published and lectured on educational frameworks for teaching psychotherapy and residency training programs on the intersection between neurosciences and psychotherapy and on the psychodynamic dimensions of film and, le and literature with a particular interest in the works of William Shakespeare. In January of this year, he contributed to the Washington Post health and wellness column called Wellbeing with his article that was entitled Three Skills from Psychotherapy That Can Change Your Brain. And it was really well received. We got a lot of feedback from that from the general uh, public that um, receives that. He is author of the Object Relations Lens. I happen to have a copy of it right here. Um, a Psychodynamic Framework for the Beginning Therapist. Um, just very prolific um, and very inquisitive he is. And finally, I do believe he is the only psychiatrist on campus in our department that actually has an analytic couch in his office. And you go in and you're just tempted to lie down and start talking. <laughs> um, so, so happy to have you with us, Chris. Uh, please join me in welcoming, welcoming Dr. Chris Miller as he presents There is a World Elsewhere Neurophenomenology of the Psychedelic Experience. You know, I forgot to make one announcement. There has been confusion by some of it to whether Grand Rounds is in person or remote. And so Doc, uh, Dave Flax, uh, Liz uh, Tafita and I got together and we will be starting in July, able to enter and update the link you get for Grand Rounds stating what it is um, in person or, or fully remote. So I just wanted to clarify that. Dr. Miller. Hello. You hear me okay? Very good. Thank you. It's a very kind introduction. It really sets the bar high, but I'd have it no other way. All right. So I put my email down there at the bottom. I'm hoping that we'll have some time for questions. I'm not too optimistic about that. This is an immense topic and it's an immense talk, but we will be done by 1.30. Um, so just like Hitchcock has to appear in every one of his movies, there has to be some Shakespeare. So this title is actually from Coriolanus. There is a world elsewhere right before he shuns everybody he knows um, and goes off and does dangerous things. Um, so during this particular talk, um, I'm going to be covering some of the broader dimensions. Um, oops. I think I closed something over here that I need. 
Uh, there we go. Some of the broader dimensions um, pertaining to neurobiological and subjective experiences with psychedelics. And part of the appeal um, of this class of drugs really is how they can change and shape our sense of reality during and on the, on the other end of use. So I'll get the hang of this eventually. All right, I'm gonna start with a quote and this is by um, the mother of the ashram, Mira Alfasa, interviewed by Louis Mall in the documentary, Phantom India. Revelation is always present, it's always here. We're the ones who don't let it in. Knowledge is always present. Enlightenment is always present, floating above everything, ready to be received. It's only because we're so completely blinded by everything we think we know and want to do that we can't receive it. But at the moment we surrender for whatever reason, it makes us a bit passive and open, and that's when we receive it. And this is thematic uh, of some of what we're gonna be talking about today in terms of what makes for a useful psychedelic experience. So these are the broad topics. They're gonna to make more sense uh, as we delve in more closely. Um, so in discussing the impact of psychedelic use, I'm gonna be talking about how they change how we think, how they, how they affect our experience with others and how they affect our sense of self as well. So we might as well start with the first one there. Um, so there are realms of experience of the mind, of the unconscious, some would even say of the divine that we all have access to that we're only fleetingly aware of them before they escape our grasp, just like this divine pen here. And according to the psychoanalyst Wilfred Bion, um, everybody has a, a non-psychotic and a psychotic function of the mind. And by psychotic, I mean less organized realms of thinking. And these psychotic functions are given freer reign under certain conditions, such as dreaming. And I will be getting to the neurobiology of dreams later on in the talk, um, but the degree to which thinking is chaotic or organized is on a spectrum. So we're not necessarily rational all the time as we know very well. And interestingly, there's a similar bizarreness and there are bizarreness scales to waking fantasies in individuals with schizophrenia and in the dream content of non-psychotic controls. Um, during REM sleep, there's also an increased activity in the D2 receptors in the mesolimbic pathway, which is the same, one of the pathways that's overactive in schizophrenia. So we all have these realms of functioning in our minds. It's really a matter of how much they're being pushed down versus how close to the surface they are. And in dreams, they're given more space for expression since our cortical inhibition is decreased. And it's thought that accessing these less organized kind of bizarre realms of our mind can lead to creative and spiritual insights. So it's one of the reasons that people have turned to psychedelics because accessing these less organized realms can offer new knowledge into old information. Hallucinogens have been around for a very long time. Um, they've been used in shamanic rituals, in the Ellicinian mystery cults, in oracles. And whoever the mystic, the shaman, or the guide was for the community would often use these mind-altering substances to facilitate engagement with a broader reality than the rational conscious mind would allow for. The mystery cult of Eleusis had a number of famous initiates, uh, Julius Caesar, Hadrian, Plato, Socrates, Marcus Aurelius, and they would walk the 19 kilometers from Athens to Eleusis, which was called the Sacred Way, and they would drink a barley-based um, drink that was laced with ergotamines, and then they'd go into this dark chamber with the guide, and they would somehow understand the meaning of life and death. So these rituals went on for close to 2,000 years uninterrupted until the Roman emperor Theodosius I crashed the party, turned on all the lights, and turned off the music and said, scram, um, and then they stopped. So the use of hallucinogens in rituals was a way of finding otherwise unattainable information. They were used to communicate with ancestors or supernatural entities in order to solve problems, diagnose and treat illness, obtain foreknowledge of the future, and to make collective decisions, including matters of the state. So talking about kind of losing access to the divine, it would seem like a joke these days to consult a poet or to interpret dreams to decide about some serious political matter. But people took the non-rational much more seriously back then. Um, 
So we just had the Ides of March yesterday. Um, you know, the play Julius Caesar in many ways is sort of a testament to how much can go wrong when you ignore dreams and soothsayers and poets. Talk about that another time. Um, that's a juniper leaf over there, which in some rituals was actually burned and inhaled um, by the guide. So these drugs have been around for a long time, as I mentioned. Um, estimates can vary as to when they really started being used. Detection methods within anthropological research have become more sophisticated, but mescaline seems to date back at least 5,700 years. Peyote has been found above the Rio Grande um, in caves. Psilocyte mushrooms have been ingested by our ancestors, our ancestors for a very long time. The thought is since the hominins started intensifying their foraging activities on the ground, they would start ingesting mushrooms as well. Fasting forward to modern times, they've inspired many creative and scientific endeavors too. The Beatles, um, the blue sea in the sky with diamonds, that's just a coincidence that that's LSD. That has nothing to do with LSD. Um, but the song, It's All Too Much, was written by George Harrison, ostensibly under the influence of LSD. And on the album Revolver, there's a song called She Said, She Said. And I thank Max Spaderna for telling me about this. He knows everything about music. Quiz him, please. Um, but that song was written um, while George, uh, George, John, and Ringo were doing LSD when they were on break from um, a 1965 tour. The transgressive, very interesting Argentinian French director Gaspar Noé has a couple of movies that speak to the psychedelic experience and to the void, which actually shows a first person account of what it's like to use DMT. And he links the trip with um, the Tibetan Book of the Dead. In climax, um, a bowl of punch is laced with LSD, and things happen after that. Um, this here is a picture of the Earth, as you'll all be able to recognize. You all live here. Um, Stuart Brand, um, he was an American writer, and when he was on an LSD trip in San Francisco and he was looking up at the stars, he's like, man, we really need a picture of the Earth. So he started lobbying with NASA to actually show um, the Earth from space. And this is from satellite AT3. You'll all recognize the work. Um, and this actually started some of the climate change um, movement um, to address the climate crisis back in the 60s. Because when we look out, you know, there's a reason people think the Earth is flat and has unlimited resources. And when you look out into the horizon, that's what it looks like. But when you look at this little marble in the sky, we realize just how fragile and limited it is. Silicon Valley, back in its origins, but also more recently, the use of psychedelics has helped people sort of break through some of their creative deadlocks. Um, Ken Kesey, who read One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, he was um, part of the infamous MK Ultra um, operation, or he volunteered to be a participant anyway. Um, and then he published this book um, in 1962. Um, and, you know, going back some centuries, Hieronymus Bosch, the Netherlandish um, painter, he had a lot of very strange things. Um, but one of the things that he was a little bit fixated on was St. Anthony. And you probably all heard of St. Anthony's fire, which is a form of ergotism. So this happened, you know, with some frequency back then and was caused by eating rye bread that was contaminated with a fungus and people could have sort of psychedelic-like experiences. Um, and there was a thought that maybe Bosch was under the influence under certain circumstances. You know, some of the figures in his paintings, you know, are sort of self-explanatory as to why people think that. That's a little unicorn cat there on the bottom right. Um, so the term psychedelic dates back from 1956. Humphrey Osmond was an English psychiatrist who, who coined it. He got it from the Greek for making the mind visible. Um, the classic psychedelics are sometimes called serotonin hallucinogens. We are unfortunately not going to be talking about ketamine today. Um, we're just going to be talking about the serotonin ones. But one of the definitions for these psychedelics is drugs with LSD-like actions that alter perception, emotion, and cognition without impairing memory or inducing delirium. So LSD was first synthesized in 1938 by the Swiss chemist Albert Hoffman. DMT is present in natural sources, um, as we'll show later in ayahuasca, but um, the synthetic version was produced by Richard Mansky in the early 1930s. And on the heels of synthesizing um, LSD, in the 1950s and 60s, there were a lot of studies 
that came out, a lot of papers published, a lot of people who were involved in sort of testing the efficacy of these drugs. Systematic reviews came along um, showing improvement in a number of different conditions. You'll all recognize Timothy Leary up there, especially because I put his name there. Um, worked at Harvard along with Richard Alpert, who um, later became Ram Dass. Um, but there are a number of different experiments which they did. I'm not going to get into all of them, but the Good Friday experiment, you know, which is sort of suggested down there on the left, showing that these drugs also acted as entheogens and entheo. Entheo means having God within. Um, so divinity students under the influence of psychedelics had sort of profound religious experience. Whenever you say that you're enthusiastic, it actually means that you're filled with God. So, you know, careful. Um, and the Concord prison experiment, um, also headed by Timothy Leary, showed that psilocybin can actually impact recidivism in people who are incarcerated. So a lot of, you know, studies and a lot of interest. And then the Cut It Out crew came along and said, stop it. Um, and made these drugs Schedule One under the Nixon administration. Research was heavily restricted. Um, you know, all the funding kind of disappeared until sort of recent times. Um, but there's been a boom, as we know, otherwise we wouldn't be here. So these are the three categories of psychedelics, serotonin psychedelics that I'm going to be talking about. Um, and so we're just going to start with the tryptamines. Um, tryptamine is an indolamine metabolite of tryptophan. We are all fans of one particular tryptamine, which is 5-hydroxytryptamine, also called serotonin. That's what 5-HT stands for. Um, and the two psychedelic examples we have are psilocybin and dimethyltryptamine, which is DMT. So... Psilocybin is present in <clears throat> magic mushrooms. We see down there on the right, the Liberty Cap mushroom. On the left, that's a painting by Takashi Murakami, who's a contemporary Japanese artist. So psilocybin is the prodrug and psilocin is the active form. The other example of a tryptamine is DMT, um, which is present in ayahuasca which is a vine, which you see down there on the right. You see it says soul vine down there, right? Which we'll get into the reasons for later. It's a reason to stay till the end. Um, and 5-methoxy-DMT, also called toad venom or the power, um, which is present in the Sonoran or Colorado River toad. That specimen down there on the left, there's a whole episode of Family Guy where somehow there's some toad ex ex exuding psychedelics making it to Quahog, Rhode Island. Um, but that little toad down there has a little white wart near its mouth, um, and there are also white glands on its leg that secretes um, this substance. Dogs have attacked these toads and gotten poisoned, paralyzed, and killed. So raccoons have learned to pull them by the leg and flip them over to feed on their belly so they don't get poisoned. That's the psychopathic beauty of nature. And B. capi is a vine. Um, so the vine that has DMT actually contains, um, beta carbolines, which actually act as MAO inhibitors. And this is what allows DMT to be oral actively because it's a substance that's typically smoked. And this may prolong its effect as well, because it has MAO inhibitors within its structure. That's Albert Hoffman, who I said, synthesized LSD. Um, he had been trying to actually find a circulatory respiratory stimulant because of its structural similarity to nicotinic acid. Um, but he developed LSD and then he tried it. And on one famous day, he rode his bike while he was high on LSD. Um, and there's something actually called bicycle day. This was some years actually after this was some years after he had synthesized it. But April 19th is bicycle day. Keep that in mind next month. Um, the phenethylamines, the main example, um, is mescaline. There are some synthetic amphetamines that I'm not going to be covering today. Um, mescaline is present in the Peruvian torch cactus and also in peyote, which is a spineless, um, that's not a put down. It doesn't have spines, uh, cactus. And the word comes from the Nahuatl for caterpillar cocoon, maybe. So that's our breakdown. Just to recap, these are the five that we're going to be, you know, there are four of them, you should learn to count. Those are the four. 
that we're going to be talking about. We'll drop in some, some 5 methoxy DMT. That's the fifth. So it was clear in the 1950s that psychedelic drugs affected the serotonin system and neurotransmission. It wasn't clear until the 80s into the 90s exactly what the um, specific receptor was. Um, but agonizing 5-HT2A does seem to be one of the main mechanisms through which these drugs lead to subjective and neurobiological effects of interest. So agonizing 5-HT2A will increase prefrontal pyramidal neuron activity, increase glutamate release, and lead to neuroplasticity. Psychedelics and ketamine are in a class of drugs that are called psychoplastogens. And this is um, referring to their ability to produce rapid and sustained effects on structural plasticity and behavior after a signal administration. This distinguishes them from things like the SSRIs, which also have um, serotonergic action. So 5-HT2A receptors are expressed in several, let's see if I can get this. Mm. Um, several cortical, subcortical areas. Um, they're concentrated in layer five um, cortical pyramidal neurons. They're here on the apical dendrites. We see them over here. Um, and we can see that it agonizing 5-HT2A leads to glutamate release. Glutamate release leads to BDNF, which is a brain-derived neurotrophic factor. That's going to lead to neuronal growth. And there's a study that came out in science um, by Vargas last month, and I thank Zofia Kozak for sending it to me. I wouldn't have found it otherwise, which it actually indicates that intracellular 5-HT2A receptors might be relevant to the therapeutic action of um, psychedelics, not just the surface ones. So further validating the idea that agonizing 5-HT2A is key to the mechanism of these drugs, when you give a 5-HT2A receptor blocker before giving the psychedelic, it can attenuate or block the head twitch response, which is the mouse equivalent of the psychedelic trip. And in humans, it can obstruct the subjective experiences and the change in brain connectivity. Prior treatment with SSRIs can actually decrease the efficacy of these drugs, because if you use an SSRI for long enough, it's actually going to downregulate 5-HT2A, so there's less of a substrate for these drugs to work on. So what happens on a circuit level when we use psychedelics? I'm going to try to be general here, but... The cortical-cortical circuits, these are higher brain circuits that kind of hold fort in terms of our working rational understanding of sense of self in the world, um, responsible for our cognitive constructs and preconceptions. The thalamus is an area that filters out the stimuli from within and outside the body. So the thalamus is really there to dampen how much sensory information we take in. This is what we would call gating. So what happens when a psychedelic is introduced. You get a little LSD ball there. Under the influence of these drugs, um, these circuits get broken up, and we're going to have much more of an unchecked influx of stimuli passing through the thalamus. So there's a decrease in gating as a result. Um, so we have this enhanced flow of information coming through the thalamus. Um, our preconceptions and prior beliefs are going to be disrupted because those higher level circuits are broken up. So this is what's called relaxing the precision weighting, W-E-I-G-H-T, of previous beliefs. We're less weighed down by how we viewed the world before, and we're much more open to coming up with new con constructs and understanding of things. We, we're going to have greater access to our autobiographical memory we're going to be able to revisit our life scripts and come up with different narratives about how we just understand the nature of reality. These drugs increase what's called signal entropy in the brain. This is called the anarchic brain model or relaxed beliefs under psychedelics. Anything goes under psychedelics, even starting the word psychedelics with an S. Um, and there's something that's called um, Shannon entropy, which is named after Claude Shannon, who's the father of information theory. Um, where basically, because our preconceptions are broken down, we're able to extract more information from the stimuli that we're looking at. So people under psychedelics will also will often say that they're experiencing actual reality for the first time, and possibilities seem much more plentiful, and limitations seem much fewer. So you would, as a metaphor, you'd be looking at a stimulus, and you'd see two possibilities, you know, sort of like a coin, it's heads or tails. 
But under psychedelics, you know, when we're just able to extract much more and think about it much more creatively and openly, we might look at that same thing and see six possibilities of looking at the same thing we're seeing a die instead of seeing a coin. And both magnetoencephalography, electroencephalography um, have shown that there's right here, over here, there's under placebo, and this is just an increased connectivity. There's an increase in entropy in the brain. Um, and this seems to happen with the um, agonism of 5-HT2A. A number of our drugs actually block 5-HT2A, and that increases synchrony within the brain. Um, atypical antipsychotics, trazodone, mirtazapine, several things we actually use for sleep can increase synchrony within the brain. Um, so interestingly, the brain seems to want to hold on to these drugs when they're used. So psychedelics do get a bit of a cellular VIP treatment. And I'll talk about this specifically with DMT later on. Um, but within the cell, psychedelics can be protonated within the Golgi apparatus, which is that alien-like thing down there on the right, to make them more acidic. And that actually retains them within the cell for a longer period of time. And this is what allows for a sustained cell signaling and neuronal growth beyond the subjective effects. So even after we're sort of back to our baseline, so to speak, they're, they're still acting within the neurons. And this is part of their psychoplastogenicity. And this also goes for LSD. When it binds to 5-HT2A, a lid actually locks it in, which prevents it from dissociating from its receptor. So there does seem to be something desirable about this state of affairs for the brain. And we will take that to the extreme at the end of this talk. But the brain seems to like dreaming since it keeps doing it. So, and maybe it likes less organized states and welcomes the effect of psychedelics too. So on the subject of dreams, um, Stanislav Grof is a Czech-born psychiatrist. He was one of the main developers of transpersonal psychology. He did a lot of research into non-ordinary states of consciousness. He talked about death, rebirth experiences under psychedelics. He also wrote about holotropic breathing, which is a drug-free way of trying to have the psychedelic experience. It is not fun to try. It's miserable. I wasn't able to do it for very long and I didn't have any breakthroughs. Um, so he said that Freud once said of dreams that they were the via regia or royal road to study the unconscious. To an even greater degree, this seems to be true for the LSD experience. So he's drawing some parallels between dreams and the effects of psychedelics. And there are striking similarities between the neurobiology of dreams and what we've been talking about with psychedelics. So during dream states, there is an increased connectivity, increased flow from the thalamus to different cortical areas. Um, we talked about the disruption of corticocortical circuits with psychedelics. There's a deactivation of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, of parietal lobe. There's an increase in visual cortex activation. Um, so thalamic hyperactivity combined with the deactivation of these higher cortical areas that are more inhibitory, this leads to an uncritical acceptance of many bizarre elements that come to us when we're dreaming. The dreams can feel very real and from sort of a psychic reality standpoint, they are. Um, like psychedelics, dreams can also facilitate creative insights. Um, dream work has been shown to be superior to waking cognition in tasks that involve cognitive flexibility, access to new meanings and understandings and finding insight into hidden or abstract rules. Those of you who do crosswords, um, Will Shorts, who's the editor of the New York Times crossword puzzle, he says, you know, we can be struggling with the puzzle for a really long time. Just go to sleep. You wake up and all of a sudden the answers make sense. All of a sudden. And I can attest that that happens maybe about 10% of the time. And it's amazing when it does. Other times I'm just kind of cursing in my mind. Um, Somebody did study this. There's a study from Frontiers in Psychology from a few years ago where they looked at whether or not taking a 90-minute nap in the middle of the day helped you be able to solve puzzles, including crosswords on the other end of the 90-minute nap. It doesn't. So dreams versus psychedelic experiences, there are differences, of course. Um, psychedelic states are marked by a clear consciousness. Um, with dreams, upon awakening, we're sort of left with the scraps of the dream content, sort of like the pen through the cloud. Um, when I was defining psychedelics earlier, I mentioned they don't induce delirium or cause impairment of memory. So people can often give vivid description of what occurred during a psychedelic state. There's a series on Comedy Central called Tales from the Trip, where people share their tales 
from the trip. So getting into some of the clinical benefits um, with these drugs, there's a lot of hype surrounding them. Um, and if you sort of compare their efficacy with um, that of some of our more traditional drugs, um, for instance, you know, with fluoxetine, which is blue here, we see that, you know, it starts to kick in. This is a change in depression score here, that typical sort of two to four week lag. Ketamine seems to be a bit quicker. And, you know, with psilocybin, very marked, very quick and very sustained and greater change compared to at least the SSRIs over here. So there's a lot of promise surrounding these drugs. Um, there were 12, a meta-analysis from 2021, um, gathering information from 12 double-blind placebo-controlled randomized trials showed that the classic psychedelics have effects on major depressive disorder that's significant compared to placebo for short, medium, and long-term outcomes. Sometimes a single dose of something like ayahuasca can lead to a significant decrease in depressive symptoms, which can last for a very long time. There was a, a well-publicized study that came out in 2021 in the New England Journal comparing psilocybin with escitalopram for moderate to severe MDD. And this was over a, a six-week course. The two groups had a similar number of patients. In the first group, they got psilocybin 25, three weeks of placebo, psilocybin 25 at, at 21 days in, and then uh, three weeks of placebo. So that's the psilocybin group. The escitalopram group, they got a super low dose. You know, this would be a mini, less than a micro dose, basically, of psilocybin. And they got escitalopram, 10 milligrams for three weeks. Then they got another super small dose. And then they got the highest dose we typically go nowadays on escitalopram for another three weeks. And then they looked at how people fared at the end of six weeks. So there was an improvement in depressive symptoms for both. And this is the quick inventory of depression um, up here on the, on the top here. So a trend for psilocybin, um, which was not significant in terms of helping depression and helping well-being, this other little graph down there. But you know, when you look at the remission rates, it's pretty striking. 57% for psilocybin, 28% for escitalopram. And the sample size is probably what kind of hindered it from reaching statistical significance. You know, this is, it's not quite an arms race right now, but, you know, I think a lot of people are trying to get out their studies, you know, so that, you know, that might've factored into really trying to get this out there because it's a very interesting find. So exciting, albeit non-statistically significant. Um, but, you know, cautionary note, you know, despite all the hype, about 50% of people may relapse um, in depression specifically within six months after receiving psilocybin, which indicates maybe more than one dose is necessary. Um, and another problem is there are very high rates of disqualification from these trials. You can see very high percentages of screened individuals are actually excluded. Um, and this is just a comparison between um, the number of people who were screened and percentages that were accepted for vortioxetine, um, which is a bit of a newer antidepressant, 83%, 70%, whereas psilocybin in studies by prominent figures, very low percentage of people who are actually allowed to participate in these studies. And I'm not going to get into all the exclusionary factors, but there are a lot of them, these very long laundry lists. So it kind of, people get their hopes up, they're suffering, other agents haven't worked, but almost, you know, it's very hard to get through the door. So in, is the caution justified, I guess? So these drugs can have a range of side effects a lot of them hinging on the dose used and the setting in which they're used. We'll get into some of those factors later. Um, but some of the common side effects, medriasis, which is pupillary dilation. Um, there are some people in Ecuador, the Shuar and the Quichua that actually give their hunting dogs um, alkaloids, such as scopolamine and atropine to cause that um, pupillary dilation, but also some plants with DMT to increase visual acuity so they can hunt better. Mild hyperthermia, mild tremor. And the GI distress is an interesting one. There are a lot of serotonin receptors in the gut. As we know, it's one of the reasons that we tell people who are started on SSRIs, you may have some GI distress for the first week or so. Most serotonin comes from the gut. Um, but people who use ayahuasca, it's considered at times part of the ceremony for you to have bad nausea, bad vomiting. I mean, is there any good vomiting? Vomiting, nausea, diarrhea. It's part of the purging cathartic experience. Um, and it can last a while because you know, you have that MAO inhibitor in there too. 
So even for treatment resistant depression, emergent and worsening of pre-existing suicidality can occur. Um, in non-clinical situations where there wouldn't be as much control over the doses being ingested and in which setting in which the setting might not be as reliably structured, you, there might be more serious reactions reported, including seizures, um, panic symptoms, paranoia, violence, and more prolonged dissociation. So set and setting are very important, and we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, <clears throat> psychosis has been reported as a side effect. Um, there's something called apophenia. Um, Carhart Harris talked about the apophenia trap, and you're probably wondering what that word means. When we start viewing connections and patterns um, in things when they're not really there. Um, and, you know, there is sort of a sense of unity and wholeness and of connectedness that, you know, people are going to experience when they're under the influence of these drugs. But if this lasts past the intoxication and it impinges on our ability to properly reality test, that's an issue. I would say that's the man in the moon. Whether you believe there's one and not or not, you know, that's apophenia versus not. So this isn't quite a side effect necessarily, but people can become rapidly tolerant to these drugs. Tachyphylaxis is uh, a rapidly diminishing response to successive doses of a drug, um, rendering it less effective. So um, people can become rapidly tolerant, then you have to stop for several days for, to keep working. People who microdose will often follow the one day on, two days off principle um, for up to several months. You probably didn't even remember that there was an outline, but there is. Um, and this is the second bullet point here. Um, talking about uh, a little bit of the intersubjective dimensions of the experience itself. This is the sort of time course of the subjective experiences induced by psychedelics. Um, the actual psychedelic state can last for minutes to hours, depending on what you're using. So we'll start here. Um, so We'll take a look at the typical doses and the expected duration of action for these different drugs. LSD, um, 100 to 200 micrograms, 8 to 20 hours. If you look at some of the older studies, those that like really looked into psychedelic psychotherapy, really wanting people to have very strong spiritual breakthroughs or sometimes for substance use disorders or OCD back in the day, they do up to 1,500 micrograms of LSD, um, which also increases you know, the propensity of having bad trips. Psilocybin, 10 to 30 milligrams. Um, some protocols um, do dosing by body weight. Um, there's been some moving away from that towards more of a standard dose. A study that came out this year by Meg Spriggs in the Journal of Psychopharmacology showed that BMI doesn't actually predict uh, response to psilocybin. Mescaline has the lowest potency among the naturally occurring hallucinogens. It's 30 times less potent um, than psilocybin. DMT is a bit of a funny one. Um, that's a, more of an approximation than anything in terms of the dose. It can last for a matter of minutes if you're smoking it. As I said, ayahuasca has the MAO inhibitors within it that can actually make it last longer. Um, some people may combine DMT with MAO inhibitors to make it last long, but sometimes it's just six minutes. And there was one blogger out there who you know, said that he would smoke it before he'd go to school. He said, I can either meditate for 20 minutes or I can take a hit of DMT and you know have um, Mother Universe, give me a hug before I go off into the world. I've been meditating. Um, so in terms of microdosing, uh, I'm not going to get into it too much, but there's a lot in the media about it. Um, this is a low dose of a psychedelic, which is devoid of any subjective psychoactive properties. So it's about one-tenth to one-twentieth of your typical recreational dose um, or clinical dose. So that threshold for subjective effects with LSD is about 10 micrograms, and we showed 100 to 200 in most studies. Psilocybin, it's about three milligrams. Um, so, you know, microdosers have reported an improvement in mindfulness and creativity, focus, happiness. Some parents said it's replaced wine for them at the end of the day. Um, so, you know, there isn't a clear benefit on cognition. You know, there is some psychological benefit that's reported. The big thing is the placebo response that really confounds these studies because you're not really getting a subjective experience from either of them. So the placebo response can be significant um, and it doesn't really seem to separate so much from the actual psychedelics um, in well-controlled studies. Now, there is some evidence that even sub-perceptual doses of LSD can change connectivity patterns in the brain. So more to come. And this is, <clears throat> more of a theoretical um, risk, um, but it's something to keep one's eye on. 
Um, any drug that agonizes 5-HT2B um, has a risk within it of leading to valvular heart disease, especially if you're using it with some frequency. So some anorectic agents and some drugs used for Parkinson's that are 5-HT2B agonists can cause valvular heart disease. MDMA can actually do it. That's been shown. And LSD and psilocybin both agonize this receptor. So this is a theoretical risk. And at least when I last looked, which was very recently, I had not seen any studies showing that they cause it, that this risk has been brought up uh, by several authors. On to happier things. So people can have very strong, very meaningful experiences um, under the influence of these drugs. Um, as I mentioned, there's gonna be an increase in autobiographical memory retrieval. People will revisit their life scripts and their past experiences, greater feelings of connectedness, a deeply felt positive mood, sense of sacredness, transcendence of time and space, feelings of grief. They may hear a guru or an entity giving advice to them. And they may emerge with a feeling of a task that needs to be performed, including a wish to repair relationships. Um, Psychedelic experience can involve having contact with ancestors and archetypal figures. And this goes back to some of the mystery cults, shamanic rituals I was mentioning before, in which these drugs were used to establish contact with ancestral figures. This all exists on a spectrum. So with some variation, mescaline, LSD, and psilocybin give experiences like the ones I mentioned in the previous slide. You can have all of this as well as much more with much stronger drugs like DMT and the 5-methoxy DMT. Um, so people can encounter reality and beings from alternative dimensions of existence. They can see mythical creatures, gods and goddesses delivering insights on how to live. Terence McKenna talked about seeing the self-transforming machine elves. Um, and sometimes the messages are very complex and ungraspable. So taking this a step further, some have linked their visions with kind of the very essence of what constitutes our biological selves. So the figure of the snake, as much as it's been maligned in, in Edenic um, landscapes, um, it's actually a figure of wisdom in many cultures in Asia and South America, um, in Australia. Serpent images are often used to represent basic life force and regarded as a source of knowledge. So Jeremy Narby, um, he wrote the book called The Cosmic Serpent. He proposed that the DNA molecule, which has the form of a double helix, sort of snake-like, might be sort of a molecular counterpart to the hallucinated serpents of ayahuasca visions. So there's something core about what we're fundamentally made of that's being mirrored in the ayahuasca visions. There's a whole book on it if you want. So moving to the afterglow effect, um, this is um, characterized, and we see here they can last from days to weeks. Characterized by an elevated energetic mood, relative freedom from concerns of the past, from guilt and anxiety, there's a greater willingness to enter close interpersonal relationships. This afterglow can last for two to four weeks after a session. And during this period, the effectiveness of psychotherapy can actually be greater, which is one of the reasons that integration sessions after the psychedelics are so necessary to kind of capitalize on the gains um, and to make sense of what the person went through. Um, in this study showing well-being and social connectedness, the end point over there is four weeks after they left a, a ceremonial location, um, there was still um, elevated compared to the baseline, feelings of well-being, feelings of, of connectedness. So this would be right at the tail end uh, of the afterglow period. Long-term effects or residual effects, we've talked about some of them, we'll talk about more um, in a bit, but um, these can last for months to years. And there are some character tra traits that are actually quite enduring, including op feelings of openness, which can last for over a year, feeling connected to other people, pro-ecological behavior and feeling more related to nature. There are some people who joke that, you know, you want to solve the climate crisis, just give everybody a dose of LSD. There's no way that could ever go wrong. Um, but I am going to come back to the, to the actual psychedelic state. Um, how do we measure this? There are a number of different scales which we can use to measure the experience. Um, I'm gonna be focusing on one, which is the five dimensional altered states of consciousness rating scale, rolls off the tongue nicely. Five dimensions, 94 questions. So the first one is called oceanic boundlessness. And this is characterized by mystical type experiences, loss of self boundaries, feeling of happiness and feeling of at one mint with the environment. And we can draw from philosopher Alan Watts to kind of characterize the state of connectedness. It suddenly seems to you that your skin is no longer what divides you from the world, 
It's what joins you to it. What you see outside you is also you. And on a neurobiological level, during the peak psychedelic experience, there's actually an increased connectivity between areas of the brain that are directing attention inward and those that are directing attention outward. So there's more of a connection between how we view ourselves and how we view the world. And this is associated with dis dissolution of the ego and this feeling of merger and unity that we have with the environment. It doesn't stay that way because we have to function in the everyday world, but during the actual experience that's uh, been shown on a, on a, on a circuitry okay. level. So these ego dissolving properties can lead to personality changes too. These drugs have been creatively termed narcissolytics or humility connection. agonists. Um, there's a greater sense of connection with other people. We care more about what they're experiencing. We care more about their suffering. We may be less self-oriented moving from this type of mentality to that type of mentality. Um, we just feel more at one with the world. Um, the second dimension is called anxious ego disintegration, which is sort of akin to the bad trip. These first two dimensions are kind of opposite sides of the same coin. So this would be sort of a negative way of experiencing the loss of boundaries. Um, people can have anxiety over. I don't know. Nobody doesn't have priorities. Loss of control of thoughts and body and disembodied voices. Um, they may have delusional thinking and feelings of panic. So things that contribute to more serious reactions um, would be doses that are too high, adulterations of the drug or unsafe combinations, a poor environment for ingestion. And Copra mentioned this, that the most common reasons reported for incidents were the wrong setting and the wrong mindset. The third domain is called visionary restructuralization. So we mentioned a decrease in the cortical cortical circuitry under the psychedelics. Um, there is some increase in activity, connectivity in some areas. So for instance, there's gonna be an increased blood flow to the visual cortex, increased connectivity between visual cortex and prefrontal cortex, and an increased input from the thalamus. And what this can lead to is illusions, hallucinations, synesthesia, which is more typically gonna be an auditory stimulus evoking a visual percept, and facilitated memory recall. A lot of things that people see under the influence of psychedelics is based on autobiographical memory. So this actually helps um, remember things that we might have otherwise repressed or suppressed. So the visual cortex is really being pummeled. Um, so the borders of objects may be very sharp, very well-defined, intensely colorful. As I mentioned, the movie Enter the Void gives a good first person um, idea of what it's like to trip on DMT. People can have what, what are termed elementary hallucinations um, with simple geometric forms, colors, wave-like or contracting distortions, and fractals like over there on the left. Um, but this can be enduring and cause problems as well. There's something called visual snow syndrome, which sort of looks like a static -y television set there on the right. Um, and also something you'll recognize from the DSM called the hallucinogen persisting perception disorder which can happen in you know, about 4% of people who use these drugs. Um, it's most associated with LSD, but it can happen with a number of the other ones. And there are two types, one that's brief and the other that can actually um, wax and wane over the course of months to years. It's pretty scary. Um, acoustic alterations, which is somewhat akin to the visual part. Um, people will be hypersensitive to sounds. Um, experiencing auditory hallucinations. LSD actually agonizes um, D2 receptors as well. Um, so that can lead to further hallucinations. Terrence McKenna mentioned that when you first use DMT, you're gonna hear a crackling sound like cellophane when it starts kicking in. These drugs can cause tinnitus, which some have rationalized as the literal sound of creation when they're under the influence of the drugs. Um, the dorsal cochlear nucleus, the auditory cortex, all have 5-HT2A receptors. This is an excitatory receptor subtype. Um, so there's difficulty modulating and dampening acoustic stimuli. And other serotonin drugs can cause tinnitus too. It's one of the very unpleasant side effects. Very rarely, but it does happen with SSRIs. And it doesn't always go away when you stop the drug. The last dimension is altered vigilance. Um, and vigilance can go in either direction, really, which makes set and setting so important for the experience to be helpful as opposed to terrifying. So 
what we mean by set and setting. Set is the attitudes, the, the moods, the emotions, the thoughts of the user. Setting is the physical and social environmental context in which the person's using. They say you should never go into a psychedelic experience when you're having a bad day or when you're in a bad mood. Um, there's a lot of preparatory work beforehand, so you know what to expect. You can try to be in the right mindset for the experience and get used to the setting too. People who are doing like MRI studies, they'll have them go there first, you know, get used to the noise, get used to the space and such, because it can be disconcerting otherwise, because the person's supposed to be able to relax. The strength of the therapeutic alliance has actually been shown to predict emotional breakthrough and mystical experiences with psilocybin, and it's also correlated with an improvement in depression scores. Um, and this study here was an offshoot of that Lexapro study that I showed earlier. So there are a number of factors that have been linked with a positive psychedelic experience. Nature and music, particularly, um, have been shown to amplify positive experiences and to decrease the negative ones. Music has been termed the hidden therapist. It's associated with achieving mystical experiences. Um, Ancient medicinal ceremonial practices with psychedelics frequently incorporated music. When you agonize 5-HT2A, this can actually reshape the acoustic properties of music. And our regulatory processes are decreased when we're using psychedelics, so we're much more open to the influence of the music. And this was the report of a patient who said under the influence of psilocybin, the music absolutely takes over. Normally when I hear a piece of sad music or happy music, I respond through choice. But under psilocybin, I felt almost that I had no choice but to go with the music. And music during the psychedelic therapy is actually correlated with insightfulness because music can evoke autobiographical imagery, memory recollection. So a playlist could be individualized to have personal resonance, even songs that the person may have been listening to during a particular age or exposed to during a certain age. Listening to music we were around when we were between five and seven or so can actually have a calming effect on us, even if we don't like the song. Um, and some protocols may include selection of personally meaningful music. They don't want to have too much variability in sort of the playlist because that can, you know, sort of interfere with the findings. But usually the progression in psychedelic sessions is to, is to move from light classical music at the beginning and then concertos during the body of the session. We see here musical intensity. There's the ascent period, the peak and the descent period. It, it's, it spans over 350 minutes, and this is supposed to map onto the use of psilocybin. This is the um, Copenhagen Music Program. And there are a number of different protocols that you can look at. These are lovely songs to listen to, stone cold sober. Um, now, somebody actually did study whether or not it made a difference if you listen to a Western classical playlist versus an overtone-based playlist. By overtone, Tibetan singing bowls, gongs, chimes, bells. Um, they were looking at, again, nicotine cessation, that Copenhagen program I mentioned, it actually melds both types. So there was a non-significant trend favoring the overtone list for mystical experiences and also for um, actually stopping smoking. But again, you know, these are attractive trends, I think, even if it's not significant. And our last section, which is um, addressing the personal changes in one's outlook on life that can happen with psychedelics. So psychedelics can influence our metaphysical beliefs, move us away from being too materialistic. Um, the study by Timmerman showed that materialism decreases and supernatural beliefs increase. Escitalopram, which is the absolute punching bag for these psychedelic studies, has been shown not to make you less materialistic. Um, that's the point of this, even if psychedelics do. So don't expect that from your patients. So the quality of the psychedelic experience is a mediator of these long-term changes. So systematic reviews have shown a significant number of studies supporting that there's a correlation between mystical experiences and clinical improvement. What do I mean by mystical experiences? Sense of transcendence, joy, awe, um, feelings of um, spiritual growth and connection with the deity. And this crosses a number of different diagnoses. That's Bill W. Uh, who was one of the co-founders of Alcoholics Anonymous, along with Dr. Bob. Um, and he had experience using LSD back in the 50s. He felt it could contribute to ego reduction and be of use in spiritual development, facilitating self-acceptance and self-surrender. There's an inverse correlation between substance use disorder risk and measures of self-compassion. So the nicer you are to yourself, the more you love yourself, the less you may use. 
So this might align with um, some of the spiritual and religious elements in Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, and the benefits of LSD have been shown after a single dose in alcohol use disorder. And then this uh, meta-analysis concluded right there, period, a year before Bill W. died. Um, and they used higher doses than we use nowadays, but a single dose between 450 and 800 showed benefits that lasted up to a year later. And there was a study that came out very recently last month in, in military psychology, which um, was done in um, special ops um, individuals who had PTSD and, and alcohol use disorder. This was at a retreat in Mexico using Ibogaine and 5-methoxy-DMT. Ibogaine hasn't gained much traction in the US. There are clinics in South America, there are clinics in New Zealand, in Central America that use it. Um, it was used back in the 80s, 90s. There was a drug called Endabuse, um, and there was some thought that this drug could actually decrease cravings and help with opioid use. Um, but then there were concerns about toxicity, so um, research kind of stopped on this drug. So, but Ibogaine and 5-methoxy were used on separate days in this study. People were surveyed at one, three, and six months, and there was a significant reduction that lasted through six months for alcohol use, PTSD symptoms, with a pretty considerable effect size, which is you know a hair over what we usually see with SSRIs. SSRIs weren't used in this study. This is just an effect size for comparison. Um, so it's pretty promising, although there's a lot of promise with MDMA for PTSD, and that is a whopping effect size that, that, that we saw in this 2021 study. So psilocybin use can decrease um, nicotine, alcohol use, which can last for quite some time. This does seem to correlate with the intensity of the mystical experiences that people have. Um, this feeling of connectivity, connectedness with others does factor into people's ability to stop using. So people view themselves as part of a greater whole. They don't wanna poison or harm their bodies. And as Narani said, love is a pretty big distraction from addiction. So what predicts um, mystical experiences, given how wonderful they are, you may wonder how we get there. When using mushrooms, Terence McKenna, he would say, come in little green men as his way of trying to get to that place. He stole that from I Love Lucy. Um, but something that predicts is the ability to surrender. This mental apprehension is a negative predictor. Um, and one mantra, which was used by the psychedelic therapist at Hopkins um, back in uh, about eight years ago, nine years ago, was trust, let go, and be open. Um, it's about curiosity. It's about not running away, openness to truth, the broader views of self and the world. Matt Johnson, who's a researcher at Hopkins, said, if there's a door, open it and go into it. If there's a stairwell, go down it, or stairway, go up it. If there's a monster in the mind's eye, you know, don't run, approach it, look it in the eye and say, you know, let's talk. And in some Jungian work, lucid dreaming entails exactly this, like confronting the figure in your dreams, trying to learn what they have to teach you. If you want to stop feeling you're at the mercy of the monsters in your mind, stop viewing them as though they weren't part of yourself. And some people have compared psychedelic states to lucid dreaming. The people who have very highly rationalistic personalities or who favor control and structure are less prone to psychedelic states. Um, it was thought back in the day that people with OCD would be resistant to these drugs. Um, there have been some animal models showing that using 5-HT2 agonists can decrease marble burying behavior in mice, which is kind of the mouse equivalent of OCD. Um, there were studies in humans, um, this study by Moreno with nine subjects, they all received four discrete doses of psilocybin and they're using the Y box, there was a decrease in core symptoms in all of the patients. Other predictors more generally, openness, acceptance and surrender as part of personality traits. Um, whereas people who are high in preoccupation, apprehension and confusion were more likely to have adverse reactions. Um, Being engaged in previous spiritual practices can also help people reach these kind of mystical experiences. So people, uh, Buddhist practitioners were twice as likely to have the mystical experiences compared to the general community. Because um, again, it's all about sort of cultivating that sense of surrender and this and their previous practices facilitate that oceanic boundlessness and egolessness. After a psychedelic, subsequent meditation sessions were actually found to be more effective when fewer barriers. But as we know, introspection isn't always pleasant. People who meditate, a fair number actually have unpleasant psychological experiences. This can include hyperarousal, anxiety, dissociation. 
Um, so ordinarily under normal operating conditions, our prefrontal cortex is sort of keeping a lock on how active the amygdala is. The amygdala is involved in valence attribution to environmental stimuli with our conditioned emotional responses and such. So with psilocybin, that actually breaks this up a little bit. So it decreases this coupling. So the amygdala is disinhibited. There's increase in activity and we have a heightened emotional experience. So along with the increase in the thalamus activity, this seems ripe for new meaning to be extracted. And the peak psychedelic experience really is about the intrapsychic. It's less about the interpersonal. Nobody takes LSD and does a cuddle puddle. Um, we're not doing therapy when the person's actively tripping. That's why the early sessions, so they know what to expect. And then the integration sessions are more important, even though people are trying to patent hand holding, as Dr. Ramprashad taught me, you know, there really isn't much more that one can do during these sessions, you know, other than kind of be there because it really is um, a journey within. Um, and the idea of letting go, of giving up our sense of control really does seem to be central to how this takes place. So our defenses are stripped away. We have to accept um, the conditions of reality. There's an unmodulated influx of, this, of these internal stimuli, and this can often lead to grief. And grief is actually considered to be a key mechanism in some psychedelic-assisted therapies. As a patient reported, there was a lot of sadness, really, really deep sadness, the loss, the grief. It was love and sadness together and letting go, I could feel the grief and then let it go because holding on to it was hurting me, holding me back. It was a process of unblocking. And Costello Fidu said, you know, contact with reality is always dreadful. And those who cannot feel haunted cannot be in, in contact with life as it is. So there are some factors that actually impede people from reaching this place of grief under psychedelics. One third or more of people use cannabis along with psychedelics. And hemp was called by Frank King in the Af East African Medical Journal, the assuager of grief. You'll all remember from the Odyssey that there was mention of an anti-sorrow drug that would take away all people's, people's pain. And there was thought that that was a form of hemp. Um, and in one study that employed psychedelics, people who also had cannabis in their system um, were not able to reach that state of grief, which is limiting to experiential acceptance. So if we look over here, basically people who weren't on any cannabis were able to kind of touch that dimension, but any use of cannabis decreases the person's ability to grieve under psychedelics. And the ultimate measure of accepting loss of control is death. Death comes for us all, of course. And if you die before you die, you won't die when you die. I'm upset about that. Brian Muroresco in his book, The Immortality Key mentions this, but it's the idea that if we accept and process mortality while we're alive, we'll gradually make our peace with it and be in more accepting place when we reach that transition point. And some of the resurgence in the 21st century with these drugs was really to help terminally ill patients find a place of peace in their transition to death. People with advanced cancer who were placed on LSD showed a decrease in death anxiety. Those two orange um, references down there reference studies that were done in spring growth. Um, People using psilocybin who had advanced cancer also decreased in depression and anxiety symptoms, which correlated with mystical type experiences. The ego-free state and transcendence of physical existence can lessen our fear of death. And finally, I want to mention very briefly about DMT. I said I was going to talk about why it was called the, the soul vine, the spirit vine. Um, ayahuasca, the word comes from the Quechua for vine of the dead or vine of the soul. There's a lot of studies out there on near-death experiences. There's a whole society, the International Association for Near-Death Studies, based out of Durham, North Carolina. Um, there's a journal dedicated to it. The term was coined by psychiatrist Raymond Moody. People who use DMT have experiences that are similar to people who have had near-death experiences. So what goes into a near-death experience? Feelings of inner peace, out-of-body experience, traveling through a dark region, a void or a tunnel, seeing bright lights, entering an unearthly realm, and communicating with sentient beings. Now, interestingly, about 40% of all near-death experiences are marked by some entity telling the person, this is not your time, or it is not your time, which is sort of an instruction to return to their body. And this isn't only in English speakers. This has been translated from Arabic, Swahili, Urdu. Translating what they heard during their near-death experience is akin to, this is not your time. We don't know what people who actually die here, but I imagine it's quite impactful. 
After the person comes out of a near-death experience, they have a greater sense of self-worth and concern for others. They have decreased distress over actually dying, increased appreciation of nature, decreased interest in social status, no possessions too, it's hard to imagine. With DMT, we see a number of things that overlap with what we saw with the near-death experiences, transcending one's body, entering these alternative realms, communicating with entities and presences. And DMT is actually present as an endogenous trace amine in the, in the brain. It's been detected in animal tissues. It is hard to detect, but some preclinical models show that the levels of DMT may actually be similar to levels of monoamines. And you may remember from about 100 slides ago that I said that DMT gets a VIP treatment in the neuron. So it can concentrate um, strongly within neurons. The serotonin receptor, uh, excuse me, the serotonin transporter right down there, takes up DMT into the neuron. And the VMAT2, which is the vesicular monoamine transporter right over here, takes it up into the, into the vesicles and sort of sequesters them in there. And, they're protect, and DMT is protected from being broken down by monoamine oxidase, sequestered for days, actually. And it can be present in the central nervous system up to seven days after use. So when we're experiencing life-threatening situations, such as near-death experiences, the lungs actually synthesize large quantities of DMT, and it gets released into the arterial blood within seconds. Um, it's actually protected from degradation um, by peripheral MAO, so it can actually reach the brain. So, you know, there's a sense that because of some of the properties of DMT, it's a sigma receptor agonist, it may be neuroprotective. So this sort of physiological strategy might be the body's attempt to keep the brain alive longer. And this might account for some of the psychedelic-like experiences that people have at near-death moments. So people may have a psychedelic experience when they actually die. And there's this flooding of autobiographical memories that's often described as what happens when you die, your life is flashing before your eyes. And this aligns with the memory retrieval that happens under psychedelics, such as DMT. And Hamlet commented on that sleep, that in that sleep of death, what dreams may come. So arguably the drug itself is not the healing entity. We can't separate use from the set and the setting in which it's taken. The presence of the therapist surrounding the experience is fundamental to facilitating and consolidating change. This increase in stimuli receptivity and disruption of preconceptions allows for new scripts to be written. And the individual can access less restrictive, more creative and spontaneous dimensions of the mind and offer an opportunity to play in a safe setting, both during the psychedelic experience and during integration sessions, the psychotherapeutic space is fundamentally a space for play. The self-discovery can accommodate the vast, the contradictory, the expansive, the ever-evolving nature of who we are. We can accept and learn from reality as painful as it is, or we can shun it. But only one of these paths leads to self-growth, an expansion of our awareness of self and the possibility of lasting change. And ending with a quote by Rumi, this is from the guest house. This being human is a guest house, Each, every morning a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness. Some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all, even if they're a crowd of sorrows. The dark thought, the shame, the malice, meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whoever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Thank you, Dr. Miller. <clears throat> I want to say it's about 90 so people in the chat or in the virtual room. Oh, okay. So I can uh, pass the mic around for the people who are here who have questions, or you can come up to the microphone. Thank you, uh, Dr. Miller, for a very extensive uh, discourse on this topic. I, I have actually more of a comment, I guess, than a question. I guess on one hand, this seems very exciting about the, the possibility for marked improvement in patients who have treatment-resistant depression. My, my caveat to that is I'm a little concerned about generalizing from the studies. If they only take 5% of the people that are referred in, 
and then we treat everybody with depression with this because it doesn't seem like it seems like it's a very special population and i wonder what's unique about the, that five percent have a comment on that ah that's your question um i i agree i i you know i think the the resurgence has been very cautious because I don't think they want the same thing happening that happened 60 years ago, 50 years ago. Um, so, you know, if you have a history of psychosis, if you have a family member with psychosis, you know, and, and some have very, you know, very strict kind of, you know, epilepsy, you know, heart disease and such. So I think they're just trying to be careful, you know, maintaining strict protocols. Um, so my sense is, you know, it's moving from substance use, depression, anxiety, you know, there's some foray into bipolar, but even with PTSD, a lot of people are talking about with PTSD, but there aren't many studies out there using the psychedelics. Um, and the doses are much less than they used to be, but also they, I think the safety profile has been encouraging because, you know, it was more of a free for all back in the day. I think there was much less restriction um, in terms of how they're used, where they're used and such, you know, but that being said, this does encourage people to go rogue. You know, there are therapists who are like obtaining MDMA and other things to assist, you know, there's some therapists who tell their patients bring ketamine and I'll do ketamine assisted therapy with you. Um, so people are coloring outside the lines um, because the lines are felt to be a bit tight. Thanks for your comprehensive presentation. Some of your slides with all those colors, you psychedelic experience itself. A uh, couple of comments virtual reality and augmented reality nowadays is becoming big thing in general public and some of them there are programs where you can experience psychedelic uh, type of experience you have any idea about any scientific studies being done on that aspect like augmented like virtual reality that sort of reality. that sort of simulates the experience yes psychedelic type of experience oh. i didn't see in any journals or anywhere but i'm aware yeah i haven't seen any and there very well may be um i haven't seen anything linking sort of the virtual reality of the experience um because i think there is something about more than just the perception but sort of the internal state and sort of how open your brain is to whatever it is that you're Perceiving, so I I think the physiological effect. I mean, intuitively, the physiological effect of the drug to me would would factor into whether or not it's actually going to be a useful experience for the person. But again, I haven't come across any any studies looking at that specifically. It is also surprising because nowadays I'm studying a lot of literature about TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, and some of the ECT. There is so much overlap about how circuitries work with all these treatments and also combined treatments. Just a comment. Yeah, thank you. And if you're also in the uh, virtual room and you'd like to ask a question, feel free to raise your hand and we'll unmute you. I have my hand up. <laughs> <laughs> Can you hear me? I think so. Yes. Okay, this is a Tony, Tony Lehman. I just wanted to give a little <clears throat> vignette here. So it's probably, and Chris, I missed the beginning of your talk, but you may have mentioned that there was a history of LSD research at MPRC back in the 60s oh. and 70s. And I apologize if I'm repeating that, but uh, 15 years ago when I was chair, mm -hmm. Irv Taylor, who was in yeah. the chair position now, Irv uh, was very interested in addiction treatment, and there was he wanted to go to Annapolis to to uh, advocate for more research and funding for addiction research. And he said, "You need to meet a friend of mine who I want to bring in." So Irv, at the time, was probably about eighty-eight years old, and he brought to a meeting of the lead, lead, leaders of the department a fellow who was well into his nineties, Al Curlin. And Al had been the MPR, had been the director of the MPRC, preceded Will Carpenter, and Al did a lot of LSD research, and um, and I had to tell them I thought at the top, probably at the time, 
we're not going to have much luck going to Annapolis to advocate for using LSD to treat addiction and alcoholism. But um, but <clears throat> probably some of our, our graduates from the 70s, at least, can share their experiences around LSD experiences at MPRC. Uh, but I, I got to know Al a little bit. He invited me to his apartment one time, and he pulled out a notebook that he had. He was hoping we could write a scientific article together, but he had these old notes from his LSD work there. So there is a very long tradition of this work at the, at the, in, in the department, and it was very interesting to meet him. Of course, if he were alive now, he'd be delighted with your presentation, Chris, to hear this has come back in, into some favor. But at the time, it was unthinkable to really even talk about it. Thank you. Thank you for the comments. Um, I, I hadn't talked about the MPRC specifically. I mentioned a couple of Spring Grove um, references in there. Um, but I did have um, some attendings who shared sort of what things were like back in the 70s. Um, period. I have a question, if you can hear me. Yeah. I'm just curious why um, paranoia isn't more of the experience since I can think of so many, you know, common ways that people become quote unquote psychotic, whether it's delirium or, you know, schizophrenia or whatever, that paranoia is such a common part of the human existence. And I'm just kind of curious what your thoughts are about sort of biologically, maybe why what's happening when people take these substances, that there isn't more paranoia. Um, yeah, thanks for the question. I think it it can very well happen. And I think, you know, it goes back to one of the first questions about why things are so strict. And, you know, having a history of a psychotic disorder basically excludes you from participating in these clinical trials. Uh, I think because of that concern, um, and that, you know, again, may um, predispose somebody to go and use it on their own where, you know, they may not be able to titrate the dose accordingly. They may not have the right preparation. Um, and, you know, who knows exactly what the effects are going to be. We saw somebody in the ER not too long ago who um, had used, you know, DMT dozens of times and she was, you know, on the way to persistent psychosis because she was seeing all these connections between things that weren't there. And she was reading into, you know, things on the wall and the ceiling and um, feeling that she was, you know, being taken over by some entity anyway. So, and this was somebody who was functioning very well, but she had been using it in a very unregulated way on her own and just sort of dosing on herself. So I think that's why the set and the setting is so important because we don't, the mind could go anywhere under certain circumstances. And if the environment is facilitating of a bad experience, you know, that, and have, you know, sort of lasting effects and give you a very bad trip. So, uh, and as I mentioned, there are biological reasons why that would happen um, with the D2 receptor activity, um, with some of the drugs and the breakdown of anything that's kind of able to make sense because the, it's, it's sort of a bottom up from the, from the amygdala, from the thalamus and the cortex, you know, under those conditions isn't really going to stand a chance. So we need the outside scaffolding and we need sort of the presence of somebody who we have a little bit of a relationship with, who has helped with the preparatory sessions. Um, so I, I do think that it's a real concern and it does happen. And I think that's why the guardrails are where they are. Um, I was wondering about when a lot of the psychedelics you have to stop as an SSRI, like a week in advance, right? Um, so I guess I'm just wondering, are there concerns about, you know, then if it's long enough that then, you know, the effects wear off and then if the psychedelic isn't effective, then you have another like six weeks or so before the, I don't know, if, or even, I guess the hope would be that the psychedelic would SSRI going forward. That would be the hope, I think. At least that's the idea. Um, and yeah, like I mentioned before, you know, being on an SSRI does downregulate 5-HT2A, and these drugs aren't going to work as well. An SSRI decreases efficacy for psychedelics. It decreases the efficacy of MDMA also, um, because it, SSRIs internalize the CERT, so the MDMA has less of a substrate. And psychedelics have less of a substrate with 5-HT2A being internalized. 
Um, so I think, you know, you do need a washout period. Um, and the second part of your question was if you stop the SSRI, put them on a psychedelic. But if the, the goal is that it takes the place of the SSRI, then I guess there's not. It would take the SSRI and the psychedelic increase BDNF, but in the, but then also work against each other. In the well, there's a sense that, you know, and with ketamine as well, and with the psychedelics that they do something that the SSRIs eventually do. There is reconfiguration of glutamatergic pathways and increase in BDNF. It just takes a lot longer. Um, we're in a hurry. It's America. But even response rate that three months are so much worse for us. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have a practical concern. Uh, Nowadays, before things are discussed in academic journals and by scientific community, they're available to public with a lot of misconception. I really had a patient in the geriatric clinic who is abusing marijuana, and he keeps referring to me, you are against marijuana, I have all these articles, it's therapeutic. So I'm afraid because I was trained in 1970s, late 1970s, early 1980s. I worked in inner city emergency rooms, moonlighted, and there were I saw a lot of problems with these with these drugs. So I'm afraid all this research and what we are talking can actually cause a rebound of those things, and we may have to face with our patients bringing up these things. I think we're already there. <laughs> um, I mean, I. I won't ask for a show of hands, but I, you know, I've had several patients who have asked me about it. You know, they want to be on mushrooms or they've already done them and who want me to give the medical marijuana card. Um, but I think it goes back to what you, I mean, these drugs are thick and, you know, they're under the person's control to some extent. I mean, and, you know, if we're putting up resistance, you know, they may think, and especially now that they have the backing of, literature and such um i don't know i think it's a challenge because a lot of these things are easily accessible to um some states are legalizing it um oregon for right now right um so I, I i hear that and some people drop out of treatment you know i had somebody who was actually starting to do well stopping the cannabis and you know taking up the ssri and on a low dose of a benzo doing well but then you know got frustrated one day went back to the weed and I became a bad object, split me off, and that was the end of that. But um, so I don't know. I think psychoeducation and trying to work on the rapport is kind of where I come from. You know, I'm not saying it's not going to help. You want relief. I recognize that. These are the tools that I have right now. Um, so I hope to find a way to work with you. But if you leave and go off and do your own thing, I mean, that's it's your life and it's your privilege to do that. Um, so I we have four minutes left. Um, this, any other questions? Otherwise, I'll look at the chat, I guess. Yes, I can send them by email. No, answer that. No. There are different modalities of psychotherapy. You know, somebody's asking about modalities of psychotherapy um, that have been used. And there are a number of um, different ones, you know, CBT, you know, the, there was a big sort of push, you know, back in, in the heyday of psychoanalysis, you know, to um, use these. When I mentioned sort of, you, you'd have the psycholytic sessions and you'd have the psychedelic sessions, psycholytic sessions, you would use lower doses to just sort of facilitate person kind of um, increasing their introspection, decreasing resistance and such. And the psychedelic sessions were supposed to be very high doses um, and, you know, to lead to some significant breakthroughs. So people have, you know, used supportive therapy, they've used cognitive enhancing therapy, they've used psychodynamic therapy um, along with these drugs. I don't know that any particular, and they've used supportive, you know, as I mentioned, but and I don't know that one particular type necessarily stands out and there's efficacy even just you know not doing a particular modality of therapy but you know just working with the person you know having a good alliance as i mentioned um and 
you know, doing the integration later on. So those seem to be the most important elements that they know what to expect um, and that they have a good experience while they're actually going through with it. Um, so, hi. Yeah, um, I can email it to you if you have your email. Yeah, yeah, that's that's totally fine. I, and anybody who wants them, I'm happy to share. Um, uh, yeah, no problem. I appreciate the comments. Um, if there's nothing else. I guess we'll stop. Thank you.